All right. Hello and welcome to the Grad Alting Workshop Series. My name is Debbie Mikutsky and I am the Coordinator of Services and Programs for Graduate Student Legal Aid, use she, her pronouns. Our focus today is not so fun, but very important, tax preparation for domestic students. So if you are looking for help, you are in the right place. And there are many resources to help you meet that April 15th deadline. So stay tuned. Um, before we start the presentation, uh, I just want to make sure that you all know about legal aid, who we are, what we do. Um, because in addition to these workshops, um, we provide support to graduate students who need help with legal issues, um, legal issues that pertain to immigration, uh, university charges, um, notarizing documents. Uh, and if you paid your student fee, then you paid for our services. So there is no additional charge and no need for you to um, sit back and wait for the solution to just come upon you. Please let us know how we can help you. So you'll just um, need to visit our website uh, to learn more about our services. Um, there's instructions on how to schedule an appointment. You can always call or email us as well. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, automatic closed captioning has been enabled. Uh, near the end of the workshop, we will post a link to an evaluation, and we do that because we need, we want your feedback. So whether you have compliments, criticisms, suggestions, we would love for you to share that. So um, we will email links to that evaluation form, um, the slides, and the recording in a day or two. Those links... Um, for today's workshop and all of our workshop are posted on our website, which is gradlegalaid.umd.edu. So um, throughout the course of today's workshop, we welcome your questions. Instead of using the chat, please use the Q&A. Uh, it makes it easier for us to keep track of those questions and make sure that everything, um, everyone gets answers. So. Let's move on to our speaker. I am so pleased to welcome back and introduce um, our speaker, Professor Sam Handwerger. Um, Sam is a certified public accountant and a full-time lecturer in the Robert H. Smith School of Business. He also serves as the advisor for Terp Tax. Um, last year, I'm gonna brag on them because Terp Tax served over 700 students. So Sam does a great job with Terp Tax and all those volunteers. So Sam, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You are running a great program and that's what makes it doubly pleasure to be a part of it. So, thank you. All right, we're going to jump into taxation basically for domestic students. So if you're of an international flavor, meaning F1 or J1 visa, this is not for you. We had that session last week and it is duly recorded on the website so you can take a look at that. And we're also going to be concentrating on people who are domestic US residents, US citizens who are full-time students. In the event that you're not in the school, uh, we are available at Terp Tax for consultation and I can help answer questions, but we will not be concentrating <laughs> on your particular situation. So having said that, let's jump into the slides and take a look at what our all our information is gonna be about. And I'm gonna go share screen with that. So hold on one second. And here we go. All right, you are a student. You're going to file taxes. Well, that's sort of with comes right now with a question mark, do you? And that's one of the things we're gonna to try to answer. When will you have to be filing taxes as a student and perhaps not. Before we get jump too far into the details, I'd like to just give you a sky high view of the tax formula so that you can see where your income fits in and how the US tax system works for a US citizen or a resident. And a resident in this case is somebody who 
uh, is here basically 183 days or more, 183 days uh, for a, in a calendar year. And then you can be, you'll be considered a resident, which means you file taxes just like I do. I'm a citizen. You file taxes like everybody else. So this formula we're going to look at applies to you. If you're here less than 183 days, there's a possibility that you're not a resident and you file as a non-resident. And that's a whole different uh, ball game. All right, we're going to get to that in a minute. First, we go back to the formula. Here we go. All right, the formula works like this. The United States taxes your worldwide income. That's what WW there. All of your income, if you're a citizen, so no matter where your income is derived, all of it is considered gross income and it's reported on your tax return. It's all taxable unless the tax code gives it a specific exemption less exempt. So that's how the formula starts. All income, unless by statute, is exempt. So if you find $5,000 in a uh, piano bench, or when you go home tonight, you open up the piano bench because you haven't played in 10 years, and you open it up, instead of sheet music, you find $5,000, that's income, that's taxable. It's not exempt under U.S. law, and you're supposed to pay tax on it. Nobody does. Oh, I didn't say that but you get the picture. It all depends on, it. you're supposed to. We're gonna do the supposed to, and we're gonna assume we're gonna be all ethical. All right, so that's number one. Then what you get to do is you get to reduce the income, this gross number, these gross numbers, you get to reduce that through what we call deductions. Deductions are allowed by statute if the statute says allowed. So if there's a law that says, oh, you can reduce your gross income by, let's call it mortgage interest or charity donations. Those deductions reduce this income up here. It reduces that income so that you can get to something we call the taxable income. Taxable income is what's going to be subject to tax rates. So again, this formula is it's the gross, which is just about everything and less exempt, minus allowed deductions. And then you get to the taxable income. From there, you take a tax rate based on the amount of income you have. We have what's known as a progressive system. So the rates go up as your income goes up, or the rates go down if you're in a lower income tax bracket. That's what we call the brackets. That's the different rates that apply to your different levels of how much income, how much taxable income you have. So it's all based on how much taxable income you have will determine the rate you pay at. So you apply the rate, multiply that times the rate, and you get the tax liability for the year. That's how much taxes you owe. Now, Next on the list, we're not done with the formula, so we have the tax liability of how much the taxes were for you for the whole year. We'll call that Y. But then you may have had, or before we do that, we'll do one more thing. You may have what are known as tax credits. Some people get tax credits, which is a reduction of Y. So tax credits could be, let's say, Z. So you take Y minus Z, and then you get the final tax number. And then you see how much you've already paid, which in most of your cases would be through withholding taxes. So have you, what have you already paid? Like if you worked for the University of Maryland, they made a withheld income tax, paid it over to the federal government in your social security number, in your behalf. And so there's a certain amount of this tax a liability that's already been paid and you'll subtract that. So we'll say, the withholding amount will get subtracted, and then you'll find out whether you are due a refund or if you still owe money. It's just a mathematical little calculation at that point. How much was withheld? What was your actual tax amount? Do you are you due money back because too much was withheld, or did not enough get withheld and you owe some dollars back to the government? About once every two years. 
I see a tax return that either Terp Tax prepares or my firm prepares, where the bottom line after taking the withholding and subtracting from this tax amount, after doing this math, the number comes out to like one dollar. <laughs> it just happens every once in a while. There's usually a differential. If you get a refund, it doesn't mean your 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 return has been prepared wonderfully. It just means more withholding was taken than was necessary. If you're due to pay more money, again, it doesn't mean the tax preparer has done anything wrong. It just means you didn't have enough withholding. Okay, now what applies to you? Now we're going to get into the uh, oh the into the the weeds, as they might say. We're going to get into the weeds of details. So hold on to your hats a little bit and bear with me that the tax code for residents and citizens is quite complex. We're going to try to zero this in totally on what you need to know. And that's where we're going to start with the kitty tax. <laughs> and you might say, well, I'm not a kid anymore. And you're right. But let's find out why we're so talking about this. Who does the kitty tax apply to? Now, this is an income tax, so it's no different than the formula we've talked about, but it's a specific type of income tax. It applies to dependent children who are younger than age 19. So at this point, you're saying, oh, okay, doesn't apply to me. And what is a dependent child? We'll go through the definition later, but basically, if you have parent, parents or guardians here in the U.S. and you live with them and that's still your home, and if you are in spring break and you were saying, I'm going home, you would go there. If the summer break and you say, I'm going to go home first before traveling, you go there. That's your home. They take care of you. They're paying for more than half of your overall expenses. Even if you're borrowing for college, even if you got scholarship, they're paying for your food and your clothing and, and your normal expenditures. They pay most of it, more than half. You are a dependent child under the tax law. Now, you notice younger than age 19, but oops, <laughs> this is what we call an oops in tax law. If you're a full-time student between the ages of 19 and 23, including 23, you are still a dependent of your parents or guardians if they're maintaining what is your home base. You live here, fine, but your home base is where you go back after school's over, or if you don't need to be here, or if they kick you out of, out, off campus, uh, where do you go? It's if you go home to where your parents or guardians are, that is your home, and you are a dependent of them by virtue of that fact, and that you're a full-time student, at least up to age 23, not including age 24. So what does this all mean? And full-time student, before we go there, what's a full-time student? At least one semester per year. That's all it is. One semester of credits per year. You can spread it out over the year. But if you're doing the equivalent of a semester during the course of the year, you're a full-time student. And you, I think you know that 12 credits to 15 credits in that range puts you as a full-time student if you're doing just that much a year. All right. An exception is a kitty ta to the kitty tax. We're going to learn what it is in a minute. Just hold on. Exception to being subject to the kitty tax is a child with earned income totaling more than half the the cost of their support. In that case, they're not a dependent any longer when they are a full-time student in college. So if you're earning a lot of money uh, more than and more than half the cost of your yearly support, then you may not be subject to it. Another exception is if you file tax returns with a spouse, then you're not going to be considered subject to the kitty tax. Most of us don't have that at this point. And here is what the kitty tax is all about. It's going to be a special tax on what's called your unearned income. And this is what your unearned income is. It's passive in nature, investment income in nature, interest, dividends, gains, also including scholarships to a certain degree, uh, income produced by gifts from grandparents, if it's a gift. Um, that's what your unearned income is. The ones that would apply to you, I think we should concentrate on are these four. We should skip these at this point in time. They get a little bit more complicated. Major takeaway from this slide is if you have passive income in your names, dividend interest, mutual fund uh, income, then uh, income from US treasury bonds, things like that, 
that income is going to be subject to a special tax rate and tax uh, way of being taxed, which we're going to see, different than your earned income. So we're only talking about unearned income, passive investment. And the reason why we go through this is because for 2023, if you have this much of that kind of income, that unearned income, 1250 that amount, that first amount is tax-free. And if that's all you have, you don't have to file a tax return if that's all you have because it's tax-free. However, the next 1250 is subject to your, your rate your tax rate. So if you're up to 2,500 of this type of income, you will pay tax on half of it at your rate, This the, the half above the first 1250, and any additional amount, 2,500 or more, gets taxed at your parents' marginal tax rate. So in the event that you have a fairly decent investment portfolio, earning unearned income for you, get a, as an oxymoron, earning unearned income, if you have a, an investment portfolio, you probably need to have somebody help you prepare the taxes because you will need to know what the parents, your guardians, tax rate is if you're above 2,500. This probably doesn't apply to a lot of you, but I wanted to get across the point that when we see that in the event that your income, your unearned income exceeds 1,250, you have to file a tax return. Here's why. Let's say race the board, get the, get the bottom line. If your unearned income exceeds the 1250 that's tax free, then you're going to have to file a tax return, like it or not. All right. So uh, we're going to come across this again, but this will help reiterate what we just said. If your unearned income is greater than 1250, you have to file. If your earned income turns out to be greater than this, Let's say you have no unearned income, but your earnings from, okay, um, working for the university, summer jobs, add it all up for the year, add it all up for the year, all the things that you made money for by working, if it exceeds 13850 you have to file. Again, we'll summarize this when we get towards the end as well. And then finally, one more type of filing that you would have to do is in the event that you have um, 400 hours or more of income from being self-employed. Question? Yes. Okay. So speaking of um, earned income, um, someone wrote in a question that they work for UMD um, in an hourly grad position. And they wanna know if federal taxes are automatically withdrawn or do they need to do that on their own? Withholding taxes are a requirement responsibility of the employer. So that is the employer's responsibility. If they fail to do that, they could be subject to some penalty, but you still owe the tax. They must withhold, but if they don't, the tax liability still falls to you. So you are still responsible at the end of the day. You right, do not they have- They should have filled out a form to indicate how much should be withheld, correct? The employer should have given you a W-4 where you tell the employer, please withhold my taxes. They're required to give you the form. If they don't, again, it's not gonna be your problem, but ultimately you're still responsible to pay the tax at the end of the year. You do not have to withhold on your own from employment. If you're working for somebody, they're required to do it. In the event that you're your own employer, that's a different story. We will talk a little bit about that later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see where we are. Okay, so we're good. Let's let's move on. This is just giving. We're going to re, we're going to summarize this towards the end. So just hold on to your hats again. Here's an example of a dependent child, which is you, if you're a full time student. You have um, no earned income. Uh, but you have, well, I don't know what that means. Let's just cross that out. Yeah, so you have 3,500 uh, unearned income and you have, you will have 1,000 subject to the kitty tax. Oh, I don't know what this means. Bad example. Let's, <laughs> I, I always like to have fun. So this slide was put in to have fun. Let's do the follow. Let's, let's correct the slide. You have 
3500 of unearned income. So of that, the first 1250 will be tax free. This keeps everybody awake when the professor has bad slides. Okay, the first 1250 is tax free. The next 1250 is taxed at your rate. And then you have to now know because you're at 3,500, 1,000, which is above, this, this accounts for the 3,500, that's 1,250, 2,500. We got another 1,000 to go to get the 3,500. It's gonna be taxed at the parent's rate. So you're gonna to need to know their rate. You'll have to get that from them or give them the information and they can pay it on their return. Okay, so that again, you can see what happens if you have 3,500 of unearned income, you're going to need to coordinate your taxes with your parents because of the kitty tax. Doesn't happen too often. If anybody has a couple million dollars portfolio working for them, please see me after today. <laughs> okay. All right. These are the tax brackets. I don't expect you to memorize them or really study them too much. I just want to illustrate the progressive nature of our tax system. As you earn more money, your tax rate goes up up, up, and up to a maximum of 37%. And if you think that's bad, when I was a youngster, really young, the highest tax rate was 91%. Don't ask me how they got away with that, but that's what it was. If you have money in your name, so to speak, on what's called an education plan, a 529 plan, set aside for your college education expenses, is that subject to the kitty tax? And the long, short answer is no. There is no tax on 529 plan earnings. That's the good news. That's why it's an incentive for your parents or guardians to have put money into 529 plans to plan for paying for your college. And that's why when you graduate and start working, you want to look at 529 plans for your future uh, dependents to help pay for their college education. So when we talk about this, um, Kitty tax, we're only talking about unearned income in your name, in your name only. Kitty tax is also applies to capital gains as well as interest and dividends. And I think that's all we're going to say about the kitty tax. Again, the takeaway is if you have is unearned income above 1250 greater than 1250 you will need to file a tax return, even if there's no tax. All right. Do you need to file taxes as a college student? Well, we've answered part of it already. If you have unearned income above the 1250 amount, you do. You'll have to look at how much money you made. This is earned income to see if you went above that 13,000 number. If you had zero unearned income. So you'd have to look at how much did you earn to see if it's above the 13, some 13,850 number to see if you have to file a return. However, um, before we go there, consider that if there are any monies withheld on your W-2 from the money that you are making of earned income, so we're talking about earned income here now, and we'll get into the details. So I'm just giving you the basic sky high view for the moment. If you have earned income and there's withheld taxes, either at the federal level or at the state level, you do wanna file a tax return, even if it's below the 13,850 number, because you're going to want to see if you can get back some of those taxes. Remember the tax formula, if your tax is lower than the withholdings, then you get back the difference. Could be you get back all the withholdings, maybe only part of it, but you're going to want to file to reconcile what was withheld to see if you owe, to see if they owe you money back and get that money back. All right, now we're going to get into if you are a dependent. Some of these numbers have changed, so we'll go through that when we get there. But what is a dependent? Um, can you can be considered someone else's dependent? Uh, uh, well, okay, so this is not defined dependent. This is going back to do you need to file if you are a dependent? And this number is now 18, 13,850, and this number is 1250. And this is or, or and or, I should say, and or. 
one more time because this is a little confusing. So I just want to unconfuse you. Dependents have different requirements for when they need to file. So we're zeroing this on you. You are a full-time student. You are a dependent because someone is providing a home for you, providing for more than half of your normalized expenses during the course of the year. Do you need to file? So this is a summarization. If you had greater than earned income of 13850 you're going to need to file. If you had more than 1250 of unearned income, you need to file. If you had $400 from being self-employed, you're your own boss, you made money uh, giving piano lessons or cutting the grass in your neighborhood, and it was more than 400 you do need to file. So cross any of those thresholds and you need to file. Cross any of them and or. All right, there's a reiteration of if you made money as a self-employed Uber driver or something, more than 400, you're gonna have to file a tax, you're supposed to file a tax return. You may not owe any tax, but you're supposed to file. All right, back to if you worked in a state that collects income tax, so you're gonna have state withholding. We went over this, but we're just again, to keep everybody on the same page. There's state withholding. Um, federal withholding, if any of that applies to your W-2 for the wages that you earned, you're going to want to file to see, see if you get any of that back. All right, dependency status in college. Let's see what we have here. Um, it matters because as we just went through, it matters whether you must file taxes or not. If you are a dependent, if you're not a dependent to someone else, the thresholds that we just went through are different. So all the thresholds we went through now are if you are a dependent, kitty tax is one of the reasons why that 1250 was so low of a requirement Every and other rules apply to someone who's not a dependent of someone else. So why, that's why you're gonna wanna know, are you a dependent? In most cases, the answer is gonna be yes. And also the person who claims you as a dependent, again, mostly parents or guardians, uh, can qualify for deductions and education related tax credits, which means that in the event that tuition is being paid, not as a scholarship, not out of the 529, so we'll say not 529, not scholarship, but tuition that's being paid by anybody in the family outside of these sources may be eligible for an education related tax credit we're going to do that at the end of our presentation. What if you have dependents? Go to another tax seminar. No, I'm just kidding. If you have dependents, if you have dependents, you can't be a dependent of somebody else. Uh, well, I guess you could be, but we'll skip that. If you have dependents, that's not today's lecture. And dep dependents would be somebody, your child or somebody whose uh, sole support, support is relying on you. Okay, what tax form do students need? Let's go through that. 1040, that's the basic reporting form that everybody who's a citizen or a resident in the United States has defined at the start of our little webinar. That's where we started from. You also need a state tax return form. There's both federal taxes that apply and state taxes. The state will depend on where do you live? Where's your residence? And the federal applies to all of us, regardless of what state we live in, as long as we're a resident or a citizen of the US. Here is the 1040, this is what it looks like. We won't go through the, this at all, except to point out that this is what you should be looking for. If you're a US domestic student, you're looking for 1040. Do not do a 1040 NR, that's for the non-residents. If you're not a resident, you don't belong here, of course, but if you are a non-resident and you're listening in, do not file this form, 1040 NR. And here's where at the bottom you get you reconcile how much your tax liability is versus what's been paid in, what, what didn't get paid in, whether you get a refund or not a refund. And that's how the forms mimic the tax formula that we went over before. All right, more forms, 1098T. This is an important one. This tells you how much tuition has been paid for you. And we're going to go through what the form looks like right here. Now, this has tax implications as well as information. The information is in box one telling you 
how much the school, the school is which will get who will be giving you this, or schools, if it's more than one, you'll get more than one of these 1098 T's. And what they'll be doing is telling you how much tuition was paid for the year. And then what they're going to also do is they're going to tell you additionally how much scholarships or grants you got from the school. That's a different number, maybe. But this is important because when it comes to taxable income, we learned the basic principle that everything's taxable unless the statute, unless the law says it's not. So in the event that you get scholarships, well, that's every that's income. So scholarships are by default income, except if it's been paid for tuition, it's not. So let me say that again, and then we'll do the math so you can see it. Why in this block here, block five, is taxable income because it's income from whatever source derived. Everything's taxable unless this tax code says no. And the tax code says the X amount of Y is not taxable. So erasing the board to show you more clearly, in the event that box one is greater than box five, you've got nothing to worry about. Zero taxable income from your scholarship. You, have, you don't have to worry about reporting anything on your tax return from your scholarships. You're done. In the event that box one is less than box five, then you've got taxable income from your scholarships. And the reason for that is that box one is the allowed amount by law that is not taxable of your scholarships. And what should be in box one are all the fees required to have gone to the school that were paid in your behalf. So it would be paid for tuition, supplies, required books, required equipment, anything that's not required by the school or the coursework that you're taking, but you bought, that doesn't qualify. So in box one should be all the quote, qualified tuition and ex related expenses, as it says there in box one. So that's why you get a 1098T, so you can do the math and figure out whether or not you have any quote unquote taxable scholarship income. And it basically means if box five is greater than box one, it means that some of the scholarship was for your spending money, your rent, your food. And that's not what the scholarship is. Um, well, scholarships could be intended for that. That's great. That's fine. But it's not using that scholarship money for required tuition uh, and fees so that the difference is an increasing of wealth for you. And that's why you do pay tax on the difference. Some people have asked about box seven, if it's checked, and that doesn't fit into the formula here. The formula that we just discussed stays the same. It's just an information box. And that is in case you don't recognize this number, it's telling you that money in the box one has, for the next year's tuition has been included, just information. So that if you're trying to reconcile box one as your total tuition for the year, it is informing you that there's more in there than just for the year. And that amount is the first, the next semester, basically. All right, 1098E will also be a form that some of you get, not all of you, but some of you will get it. 1099, 1098E will tell you how much student loan interest you paid in 2023. In the event that you're paying back your student loan, some of it might be considered interest, and this amount would go there, and it may be deductible on your return. There is a student interest deduction. It Again, you, for most of you, you're not paying your student loans back now. You'll do it after you graduate. Look for this form after you graduate so that you can include what's in box one as a deduction. Remember that word deduction from the formula. That's a deduction from your tax and reducing your taxable income. Sam, w, yes. Me? Quick question. Yes. Sure. Um, so for the 1098T document, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the taxable income the difference between box one and five or the complete amount in box five? It's the difference. So if you have, let's do some numbers to illustrate. It's the difference. Suppose in here is 1,000 
and here is 2,000. So now box five is greater than box one. The first, the 1,000 that's here is tax-free. It's the difference that's going to be taxable. So the only amount that would be taxable income would be the 1,000, which supposedly was available for your party, uh, not party, <laughs> food rent. You get the idea. Okay. So it's only the difference. Got but you need, you need to compare those boxes because that's going to let you know whether you got an issue or not. So if, for example, this number here in box five was 500, in this example, you got no problem, you got nothing to worry about. All right. Thank you, Sam. No problem. Okay. We are moving along to the W-2, which is if you work, if you made more than 600, they're supposed to give you a W-2, and they probably will. Even if it's less than 600, they'll probably give it to you. Anyway, erring on the side of caution, which is what employers like to do. And what you'll be getting in this W-2 form, that's what we call it, is your wage and tax statement. It's going to include a lot of important information for the preparation of your return. First, it'll tell you how much taxable earnings you have. It'll also tell you how much federal income tax was withheld right there. So when we talked about what was withheld, 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 there's how you're going to know. All your W-2s will have a number in here if they did withhold. If they didn't, there'll be a big zero there, and that lets you know that that's the case. You'll also find your Social Security, Medicare, tax wages and everything. That's nothing you can <laughs> – I love this part. There's nothing you can do about that. That's the way it is. U.S. citizens and residents pay Social Security tax, and so you'll see a bunch of numbers in here. And there's no getting that back until you retire. So good luck to, to all of us. All right. I think that gets you the picture of that part. This is the federal part up top where you, you know, it all relates to the federal. So this is the fed, for the federal tax return, figuring all that out. There's a couple other information boxes on here, which we won't go over, but you can take a look at your own individual W-2 to see anything that applies. Most of these other boxes are telling you information about benefits that you received from your employer, and that's nice to at least have a total of what they were. Most of them do not have any tax implications. Down here would be the state information, and it'll tell you what state it is, and good old little box 15 there, and it'll tell you the, how much you made under the state. It's usually going to be the same as box one, and they'll also tell you how much was withheld in boxes 17 and 19. So there'll be a, an amount for the state and maybe the county. Sometimes they combine it all into one, one number. Don't worry about it. It's all that it goes to the same place. But the counties do get part of the income tax as well. So box 19 often will be filled in. And that's your state withholding. You file a state tax return, show the amount in boxes 17 and 19 together. If, you, if those together are more than the tax that you owe to the state, you get it back as a refund. If it's not enough, you'll have to owe the state some money. Same as the federal, it's a reconciliation of what your state tax turns out to be. State tax is not the same rates as the federal. It's a lot lower rates. And some of the rules are different than the federal. So there's two different tax returns. There's one for the federal and there's one for the state. Or if you work in more than one state, there'll be more than one state tax return, which makes uh, for lots of fun uh, for CPAs to make a living. One more form that you get, and we're going to spend just a few minutes on this because it's kind of important for you to be aware of it. So in the event that you've been um, sleeping through, <laughs> through the tax here, this is one you want to wake up for just in case, particularly if you're a freshman, sophomore, or junior, uh, you want to really pay attention to this. Even if you're a senior, this could still apply to you depending on where you're going to end up after graduation. This is called a 1099 NEC standing for non-employee compensation, as you see there. And what will happen here is there'll, there'll be the payer, whoever's paying it will be here. Your name will be here uh, as the recipient of the money. And what they're going to be basically telling you is that you made so much money in non-employee compensation. Now, this is earned income. This form is for earned income, but not as a W-2. So they're basically telling you if you get one of these, that you were a, if you get one of these, they're telling you that you were a independent, and you might not even known that you were, that you were an independent, and it sounds really cool, but it may not be cool for tax purposes. 
You were an independent contractor, my friend. That's what the NEC, the 1099 NEC, is telling you. You were an independent contractor. And therefore, they were not required to file a W-2, and they were not required to withhold. So no withholding taxes. And that is, okay, no withholding taxes. And you are responsible for paying all the taxes on your own, which is something that you probably should have known when you first started working as this independent contractor. Usually they will tell you, and here's the whole part I want you to know in about 120 seconds. The important part to know is that somebody may employ you, quote unquote, and they may tell you that you're going to be treated as an independent contractor. And they may actually give you a form that says independent contractor. And that's really cool. And you sign it. They ask you to sign it. They're not going to withhold taxes. They're not going to give you benefits that employees get. They're just going to pay you an hourly or agreed upon rate. That is fine as long as you are an independent contractor. How do you know? Well, it's not so easy to know, but I'm going to give you some basics. And I'm going to tell you why I'm giving you the basics. First, let me give you the basics. What's the difference between an independent contractor or a W-2 wage salary earner? This is wages or salary. What's the difference? So again, it's ambiguous. It's not real clear under the law, but the basics are the following. If this person paying you is really an employer, they have a certain degree of control over when you work, where you work, how you work, how you dress, what days you can take off, what days you don't take off, where you're supposed to report, who's your boss, who do you report to, forms that you have to fill out. There's a degree of control. And that makes you an employee. You have to add up all the ingredients to see if it looks like it's more control than not control. But in the event that there is a degree uh, of control, you're probably a W-2, in which case they're supposed to be withholding. And that includes the social security tax that we saw on your W-2. If you're an independent contract, independent contractor, it means you, you are the, your own boss. You control yourself. You control when you work, how you work, how you do it. Yeah, you can get fired from a job as an independent contractor, just like an employee can, but you determine your fate as an independent contractor. Nobody tells you where to report, when to report, what days to take off, what days not to take off. And you're, if you're your own boss, you're responsible for your income tax and two times the Social Security tax which is a lot more than what it is here as an employee. And that's the rub. So what I'm doing is cautioning you in the event that you get placed here and you don't believe it's correct, it's important to sort of talk to the employer, quote unquote, right away. Because if you wind up with that 1098 uh, NEC, 1099 NEC, you're going to have to pay Social Security tax times two, two times Social Security tax on this income. And that's not pleasant to do. And if you were not an independent contractor, you shouldn't have to do it. Many players out there who are employing people, quote unquote, will play this game, get you to agree to sign an independent contractor form so they can save paying the taxes for social security themselves and throw it to you where you pay two times the amount and it isn't right. It isn't legal. If you're not a independent contractor, if you're really supposed to be a W2. So I'm just letting you know, you can sign all the forms you want. Go ahead, sign them, sign them, sign them. It doesn't make you an independent contractor. If you get into this, since it's complicated, see me. Email me. I will accept your emails. I will accept your appointments and help you out. Okay. Scholarships and taxes we spoke about. We're getting towards the summarization part now. Uh, unless you are in one of these types of scholarships, 
what we spoke about before that scholarships can be taxable if you're getting scholarship greater than tuition. We went over that. That, that could be taxable. The difference could be taxable unless you're getting scholarships from the three exceptions that you see here on this slide. Tax breaks for scholarship for college students. Now we get to the education credits. What are they? Let's take a look. Um, credits for college students or people who claim students as dependents, they exist and they could turn out to be tax breaks for the college students themselves. If tuition is being paid, not from a 529, not from a scholarship, but out of one's pocket, even if you're borrowing it, that counts. It's a scholarship. If tuition is being paid, even from loans, even from borrowing money, then it could be turning into a tax opportunity known as the American Opportunity Tax Credit. So there we go. And what is it? Is it's a tax break that will apply to either your parents or you, depending. Let's see what it depends on. It depends on who wants to use it. The AOTC is for your first, your first four years of higher education. So it's for your first four years full-time college where you're at least half time that's considered full-time so one semester per year and if your parents uh, modified adjusted gross income which you'll find on the return there's a certain line item for the return which will define what that is if it's eighty thousand or less for a single parent or 160 or less for a joint tax return meaning husband and wife or two, two parties married to each other, legally married, this goes up to 160. So if their incomes are less than this, your parents can take advantage of this tax credit and save taxes for the tuition paid in your behalf. So they will want to see a copy of the 1098T. So the first stop is, hey, mom and partner, here is my 1098T. Do you want to do anything about it? If they say, no, we make too much income, then you will be allowed to use it on the theory that you um, you can that your parents can say that for the college tuition tax credit, they're not claiming you as a dependent. Now it's only for that purpose, but they're allowed to say for that for the tuition credit, your parents are allowed to say that they're not claiming you as a dependent, and therefore you get to take. The, the deduction, the credit on your return, if you can use it. Now you have to have income to be able to use it. So you may not even be able to use it yourself. It depends on your tax situation. But if your parents are too high in income and cannot use the credit, then just tell them, tell their tax preparer to check the box that they're not claiming you as a dependent and you can try to use it on your return if you made enough income, you will have to have made enough income to make it work because you're going to have to have a tax. Well, you don't have to have a tax, actually. So, yeah, so that's, that's good. Now let's get into the fun part. Okay. So even if you didn't make enough income, you will be able to get something back for education expenses. If your parents aren't going to take the credit, you want to try to take the credit on your return because there's a refundable amount. Let's go through the mechanics of that. I almost forgot the fun part. Let's take a look. Now, again, this only applies if you're paying it out of pocket or through loans that you're going to have to pay back. So what is it? You claim the first $2,000 spent on tuition, schools and fees and books, all the required expenditures, not room and board, not room and board, And then you take 25% of the next 2,000. So if it's the first 2,000 in full and 25% of the next 2,000, that's another 500. So the total it could be is 2,500. This is the full credit that you can get. The way it will work, there's the full amount. The way it will work is that of that 2,500, if you qualify for the, all the 2,500, of this amount, even if you don't have any tax, let's say you have zero tax, 
So you can't use a credit against zero tax. However, of the 2,500, 1,000 is refundable. So you'll get $1,000 back even if you had no tax. Up to 1,000. That is like a subsidy from the American government for you going to school. And paying the tuition, not out of a 529, not out of um, a scholarship. And it doesn't matter who pays for it within your family. It, anybody can take the credit as long as it's been paid for in your behalf. See, you are a friendly tax preparer if this applies to you. And it will apply to you main, mainly if your parents are not taking the credit themselves. Now, after four years, you have what's known as the lifetime learning credit. We won't spend too much time on this because it doesn't have does not have a refundable portion to it. And um, it is really after you finish the undergraduate school, because the first four years are for the AOTC, which we just did. That's four years. But after that, any time you go to school for anything, you can get a credit against your taxes if you have taxes for the first 20 percent of the first 10,000 for any year 2023 and afterwards for tuition and fees. So take one course, take 10 courses, whatever you pay, again, out of pocket uh, or from loans, you can get 20 percent of that as a deduction, a reduction by a tax credit off your taxes, presuming you have some taxes. If you have no taxes, there is no refundable portion. The maximum amount of the credit is 2000. So after $10,000 of tuition expenses for school, it doesn't help you with this credit. That's That gets you to the maximum at 20%. It's called the lifetime learning credit. And that applies after four, the first four years of full-time, half-time college. All right. And that's, there's no limit. It's to encourage Americans to stay educated. Okay. All right. Is it refundable? The answer is no. So it only applies if you have taxable income taxable income and a tax if you have a tax then the lifetime learning credit the l l c r i never saw anybody use that an acronym for it but that's what it is okay summary let's do a little summary let's stop sharing screen take a look at who we have left still hanging on with it, all these tax informations the main thing to come away with is you have to look for certain forms. Got to look for a W-2. Got to look for a 1098-T. A 1098-E, uh, maybe, if you've been paying back your loans, your student loans, probably not yet. 1099s of interest and dividends and capital gains, you got to look for those. And you got to look for a 1099-NEC in case you were working as an independent contractor and consider talking to, we want to share screen one more time, consider talking to the great advisors, including myself at TurpTax, if you need any help. Here is our URL up here, as you can see in the box, terptaxumd.org. This is what our website looks like. We don't have a whole lot of regular in-person appointments left, but we are doing in asynchronous. There's plenty of schedule opportunity to set up for asynchronous help, either where we do your whole tax return for you or just answer your questions. There's a self-prepare option where you can get on and do it yourself. And again, advisors, meaning TERP tax volunteers would be available, including yours truly to answer any difficult questions that you come across. Um, and you should take advantage of it because it's all free for, for all of you. So and, again, and Sam, anyone yes. can use TERP tax, right? Anybody, even outside the University of Maryland, can use TERP tax. Yeah. We are traveling to an assisted living place in DC this weekend. We're going to do tax returns for some some of the residents there. We go to Cherry Hill in Baltimore City. We go anywhere you want us to go, uh, anytime, any place. <laughs> We're there. Awesome. Uh, we have uh, just a couple minutes left. We have any questions? Well, someone is just saying thank you. Very helpful. I hope so. And will, we uh, have uh, we've answered questions along the way. 
Okay. Tax planning. Some, someone asked how to reduce taxes for students. There's not a whole lot of opportunity until you turn age 24. Once you turn 24, things do change. Uh, the good news about a student is you can earn up to almost $14,000 earned where you don't pay any taxes. So, you know, go to work, uh, earn money, uh, and you don't have to pay tax on it. That's not tax planning. It's just the law. Once you uh, finish age 23 or finish college and go out on your own, then there's a whole new world out there. And we'll be glad, CPAs like myself, we'd be glad to sit down and talk to you about how to reduce taxes. I have and, a quick question. So um, I remember it was like one year where um, I got my W-2 from UMD. I got it early um, and I just, you know, quickly filed. And then I, you know, I totally forgot. So I, I had done some hours with this other program for a month. And then they sent me a W-2, but I had already filed. So what happens when when I have already filed? Like, can I go change it or... Um, especially if I have already, you know, received, um, you know, refund for the tax, something like that. Yeah. So if you file and you realize, oops, I didn't have all my forms. I didn't know it. I, get, I got another form and it has an effect. It does change your tax return. Then you do have a responsibility to file what's called an amended tax return. If you catch it before April 15th, you can just simply refile another original return. It's the last original return they get before April 15th or by April 15th that they'll accept and it avoids the amended return. But one way or the other, you got to correct the error, quote unquote, it may not be your fault, but you got to make the correction. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sam, what should someone do if they haven't yet received their W-2? Check with the employer and find out why, because it was due out January 31st. So you got to don't don't get on a high horse. Be nice, but say, hey, <laughs> and they <laughs> they might tell you, oh, your W-2s are posted on our site. You're supposed to go there to the payroll site. And that's why you didn't see it yet. So it may be all very innocent. All right. Oh. Go ahead. I have a question about 1098 or the T form. Okay. Yes. Um, so our department accidentally paid this scholarship for this year, a little too early for me. So it actually came in very late in December of last year. And it, now it has kind of like raised the box one value, uh, excuse me, box five value on that. Um. So the question I had, is uh, whether it's possible to like take that amount of money and report it next year, or do I have to just go on and put in the value for one and five exactly as it appears on the form? So we, uh, there is a way to say that that money belonged to tuition. And if they didn't do it, like they're not doing it through tuition reduction uh, through the scholarship, so there is a way to claim that your tuition was higher than box one, that it's not an automatic, that that's the only tuition you had. That's just on the form itself. And that box five, box one comparison is just a, my way of saying to you, oh, watch out if you have that. Just because you do have it doesn't mean you're going to have a tax situation when you prepare your return. If you know you took that extra amount and used it for qualified tuition expenditures, then you don't have to report it. I see. But if if it was just um if there was no qualifying um tuition at the time because the spring um semester tuition didn't kick in, then it will have to be reported. Well, if but again, if your scout if what's in box five got all used for qualified expenditures, you can it you didn't. can report it. It didn't. Oh, some of no. it actually went to your your pocket. Yes. Okay, so that's the amount you want to report as taxable income. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You you determine the what the forms do is they just tell you information. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to use that to do the calculation yourself. And if you're in calculation, it says, "Hey, I paid other qualified tuition expenditures, so not all of the difference is taxable." You can do that on your return and not pay tax on the full amount of that difference, just the amount that 
uh, was used for gets uh, available to you for your personal expenditures. Oops. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, any other questions? Going once, going twice. Well, and if you think of something, I did share Sam's email address um, and you can always um, turn to TurpTax for help. Right, Sam? Absolutely. And I enjoyed trying to explain what is very difficult. So don't blame the messenger. <laughs> uh, I, I, as a simple uh, simple explanation, I used to be able to be, do payroll returns for employers it, by the, you know, without even looking at the instructions, I would do them every month. Today, I can't, eat, I don't even bother touching them. It's got, everything's gotten so complicated. There's more, more regulations. So if you didn't understand something, consider yourself normal. <laughs> <laughs> well put, Sam. And thank you so much for, um, you know, making a, a, an, a complicated um, subject as humorous as possible. You always do a good job and you are so well informed. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I look for a wonderful tax season with all of our school and people and students. So everybody should take care. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who joined us today on Zoom and those who are watching this um, on YouTube. It's always good for us to spend time together. Um, we have workshops coming up on next Tuesday. It's wills and estate planning. That will be in person and stamp and we will have free food. So I hope to see you there. Um, the week after that, we're gonna be talking about using credit responsibly. So, have a good week, everyone. And um, as always, let us know how Legal Aid can help you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.